Welcome to the Elementary STEM Coach Podcast, a show that'll help you with lesson ideas, systems, and actionable tips to apply to your classroom. I am your host, Naomi Meredith, a former classroom teacher turned current STEM teacher and coach. With over a decade of experience teaching and a master's degree in STEM leadership, I am here to coach you throughout the year to help you gain back more time to create innovative experiences for your students. Grab your earbuds and let's get started. All right. Well, thank you, Georgia, so much for being here tonight. Uh, we were chatting so much before. I'm like, I need to like record all the times <laughs> that we're talking before because there's always like really awesome things I hear from people. And I'm like, I should record it and then save it as a bonus thing because you were telling me like really cool stuff. I'm like, I need to hit record so we can capture everything. But I know today's going to be awesome. And I'm so glad we connected in um, my first workshop, the K through two STEM planning. And then you came for the three f- through five. And I was so excited to see your name. But Yes. Um, yeah. I was like, oh, we connected. And we were chatting after that first one. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need you on here um, to talk to us all that. We have like, we have a, a guideline, but we'll chat and everything. But um, before we get into it, if you wouldn't mind telling us about yourself and um, how your journey into as a teacher evolved and then being a STEM teacher, you have a really interesting <laughs> story of how you got into teaching. Well, to back it all up, I am a first-generation college student in my family. I never um, planned on going to college. Oh. I, I'm from a farm background. My stepdad had a registered Holstein dairy and a crossbred beef farm, and I loved working on the farm. That's what I did. My senior pictures were even with my Holstein show heifer. <laughs> um, I spent so much time getting her ready, washing her and clipping her and getting her ready that I kind of forgot to get myself ready. Aww. So I was like, got ready real quick. Um, but yeah, so that was funny because the um, photography teacher at County Line where I where I graduated from, she is currently the GT teacher, among other things, but she's still teaching. She was there when I was in in school, but she was there when I got my senior picture made with my heifer. And she still remembers that when we, after we got through with the session and we were walking back to the trailer, um, Rosie saw a reflection of herself in the windows as we walked by the library and she started bawling because she thought it there was another heifer oh. and the photographer from, you know, the, the official place, he thought it was, pr- he thought it was neat. But what I didn't know until a couple of years ago is that he had a picture of me and Rosie up in his office as an example. Oh. And I wish I would have known that when he went out of business and went up there and got it. But like I said, I just found out a couple of years ago, yeah. but anyway, I was on the farm. I took off early. Um, especially my senior year to go home and start the milking. So I wasn't going to go to college. And then I ended up getting it all paid for. So during my senior year, I decided to go. I went to Arkansas Tech University and got my undergrad in ag business and came back to the family farm. Um, And I worked at the family farm until I was about 30. And then sometimes, you know, just didn't work out the best working with Mm -hmm. your family. So, um. I became engaged and we decided to move 30 minutes away on his property, build a house. For the first time in my life, I didn't have a job and I was just sitting around reading books, enjoying life. And I had a friend that was on the school board and she said, hey, she said, we really need substitutes at the elementary school. Why don't you come sub? I was like, if I can herd cows, I can herd kids, you know, I can do this. Uh, You know, can't be much worse than getting ran over by a whole bunch of calves. But um, so anyway, I started subbing and I really enjoyed it. And so God just kind of told me, hey, if you like this, why don't you see about getting certified? So I went a non-traditional route. Um, We laugh. It was called the non-traditional um, licensure. And then they thought that was, this was back when positive talk first started coming out. Oh, yeah. So they wanted to change the name and, or sorry, they, they thought it was a negative name and they wanted to change it to more positive. And so they named it the appeal program, but they called it the apple program spelled wrong. It was kind of, anyway, you have to know the Arkansas State Department. Sorry, State Department. I love you, but you know, it was crazy. So I did that for two years and then I got hired here at Boonville and it has been a wonderful journey. I started out teaching kindergarten, 
not an artist. I got fired by the kindergartners <laughs> and was told not to ever draw again, that yeah, they would draw too. for me. So that is a story that I tell every year um, when I had my own classroom that mm-hmm. I'm not the artist, not going to grade you on art. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I will ask somebody to come up and draw because otherwise y'all won't be able. If the kindergartners couldn't understand what my dump truck was when we were learning the letter D, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but I taught kindergarten for a year. And then I told them I got kicked out of kindergarten and I had to move up to third grade. I taught third grade for four years, but that is where I fell in love with science. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful science specialist at our educational co-op. His name is Dr. Curtis Varnell. He is so enthusiastic and passionate about science. And at the first workshop I went to with him, we just clicked because he's very outgoing. He's friendly. You know, he doesn't mind to be goofy. And that's just how I am. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm not sitting here bored trying to keep my eyes open, you know, and going, anybody got some popsicle sticks to prop my eyeballs open with? Um, and he was just so engaging. And the kids loved him. So we became really good friends. I started going to all of his co-op or all of his workshops at the co-op and one of the funny stories, I, ha- I sorry, I have to tell stories. So if you get tired of <laughs> me, you can, you can rein me back in. <laughs> so he does all these out of the box workshops. Like one of the favorite all time ones is we go floating down the Mulberry River. That's cool. So yes, I mean, if you have your own kayak or canoe, you can bring it or you can borrow some from the Game and Fish. <laughs> well, the Game and Fish from Barling, they come down and they do a macro micro invertebrate you know study there on the river and it's it's tons of fun but probably the second time I went um where everybody gets out is at a bird store but you have to pay to get out so we were going to float on down to a church camp oh. and Curtis had got permission for us to get out there because it was free <laughs> well we're, we're coming you know and there's a good mix of males and females well that was like um right after a music festival called Wakarusa got over with. And when we came around the last corner to Bird's store, there was two women. We we called them leftovers from Wakarusa. (laughs) Didn't have on a stitch of clothes. Oh, that's good. (laughs) The water maybe was thigh deep. And they just stood there just as proud as could be oh. as all 40 of us floated by. <laughs> so the joke is, is that all the women were paddling forward and all the men were paddling backwards. That is, that is so funny. <laughs> yeah. And so Dr. Varnell said that was the only time his wife paddled the whole trip. <laughs> So the joke is, is that um, the next day at the office that he got so many calls from superintendents and he thought he was going to be in trouble. And they said, no, we want to sign up for next year. <laughs> he gets more people double the amount signing up. <laughs> but but he has people that comes from all over the state to go, you know, just float the river because it's so much fun. It's something different. We still learn, but it's engaging. And, and so that's kind of what I've ad- adopted. I've always tried to have just a different style classroom. I've, my classes have always been really loud and I've always hated that because I'm a loud and, and ever my poor science teacher in fifth grade, she's my buddy. She has worked 12 years to try to calm me down. <laughs> I don't and think that's going to happen. <laughs> no. And to teach me an inside voice. She even, when, when uh, the, the hearing people from Children's were here one year, she even made me go get my hearing tested because she oh. thought I was might be deaf and need <laughs> hearing aids. <laughs> I passed it flying colors. So we have worked 12 years on me to learn my inside oh, voice. So <clears throat> we're, st- we're still working on it. Maybe by year 28, I might have it down. Yeah. But no, I I spent three, uh, four years in third grade. Then I moved to fourth grade. And that was really neat to loop with those kids. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the same exact kids, but I had, you know, part of them. Yeah. And it was great. Then the opportunity came up for me to teach sixth grade science. I was scared to death because, you know, I was like, well, a lot of these kids are taller than I am, you know. (laughs) Anyway, made the transition to sixth grade science. I spent three years there and I loved it. And I love to see the kids that are in high school now that come to me and say, you know, you made science so fun because you did so much hands on. We did labs and we just didn't read out the book. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a lot of fun. But then after three years in sixth grade, um, our gifted and talented teacher retired and 
the principal asked me what I thought about moving to GT. And I was like, really? <laughs> it's like, I, science is my passion, you know. Yeah. And she said, well, she said, I want to incorporate STEM in it. She said, there's nothing wrong with the way it was. She said, I'm not knocking the program. She said, but they did a lot of research projects. Mm -hmm. She said, and we're losing a lot of the kids. They Mm -hmm. need something more hands-on, more engaging. She said, I know you have done so many STEM projects. You do so many labs. And she said, I just want to see if you would consider it. And I said, okay. Well, at this time, I had just finished my first master's. It was in curriculum and instruction. Oh, nice. Yes. Um, You know, just like everybody else, wanting the security, you know, of of a decent retirement. Well, they told me you you have to have some grad classes, you know, if you teach GT. And I was like, Hmm. I just got my master's. I'm I'm good, you know. (laughs) Well, needless to say, I applied and interviewed and, and got the position. Then I find out that no, it has to be, I can't remember if it's 15 or 18 hours, but they have to be gifted classes. So back to grad school, I go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I wasn't going to go to college in the first place, and now here yeah. I am going back. <laughs> yeah, here I'm going back for my second master's. Well, you can get a gifted and talented certificate. That's the mm-hmm. 18 hours. But the difference between that and another master's was just a couple of classes. And two of them I got to use from my first master's. So I had two more classes to take. So, of course, I went ahead and got my master's. So yeah. now I'm the from somebody that did not want to go to college to now I have two masters. Yeah. And it, it's an unbelievable route. And like I say, I'm the first generation in my or the first person in my family to go, go to college. So I'm a first generation college person. Mm-hmm. And here I end up, I've got two masters up on the wall. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> so if I can do that, anybody yeah. can. And that's what I, I told my kids today. Mm-hmm. But along the way, ever since third grade, I have been doing STEM and science labs, and I love it. Um, So just kind of done a little bit of everything. And I really like this position. My administration gives me a lot of freedom. Um, I do a lot of, I let the students do self-interest projects. Um, My daughter, who's in sixth grade and in GT, Um, she wanted some perler beads when we were at Hobby Lobby or Michael's one day. And I was like, okay, well, you know, whatever. We got them. And she had such a blast with them. And I thought, well, I'm going to take these to school, you know. And for those, you know, you always have that one or two that you can't really get to do anything. You know, that Mm -hmm. they look like they are, but they're they're not. I thought maybe I can get them to do some perler beads. My goodness, every kid that I see in third through sixth grade has went crazy over the perler beads. (laughs) It has gotten so crazy. My fifth graders started talking the other day. I heard them talking about splitting the money and doing all this. And I was like, what are y'all talking about? They're like, well, we're going to start a business. Oh, okay. Yeah. I went, okay. They said, yep. And we're going to split the money. Uh, 50% of it is going to go to the person that made it. And 50% we're going to put back to buy supplies. Oh. It's like. Yeah, I was like, mm, guys, there's only one problem with that. And they're like, what? I said, I bought the perler beads with yeah. my own money, you're not like, school money. Like, Mom. I need to pay. <laughs> I need a cut of the payment. <laughs> so I made the deal with them. They, they're they not very happy, but they are still doing it. So kudos to them. <laughs> All the money they're going to make is going to go back in a pot to buy more perler beads. Oh, because good. I just bought another huge container. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. That's good so, yeah. entrepreneurial skills right there. Yeah, you actually so, can do a lot with that too. No. Well, let me tell you this. I, you need to write down this website, okay. Economics Arkansas. Okay. And I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> yes, and I'm sure every state has something like this, but just so you can go get an idea. And they have, there's competitions for high school. Ooh. Yes. You can play the stock market game. Oh. oh, if you want to know more, you can contact Marsha Masters. She's like the, the guru of this. And okay. I, oh, it, she's wonderful. Um, but yes, what is so nice about Economics Arkansas, you can even go to a one hour virtual PD with them and mm. you get to choose a book. 
Ooh. Every PD you do, no matter whether it's an hour virtual or in person, you get to choose a book and they will mail you a book for going. And you get oh. to choose which one it is. But it's got something to do with entrepreneurship or cool. the stock market. So I tried to do the stock market last year with, with my sixth graders, but I know nothing about the stock market. Yeah, and it all went right over my head. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard for me to get my kids interested in something when I, I didn't. Anyway. I will do a better job of getting guest yeah. speakers in the next yeah. time we try to do this. <laughs> but Marsha has so many resources down there. She even, I have the book um, in the bookcase behind me. Yeah. Something about, and there's one about an apple pie and one about a cherry pie. One of them, it sh- tells you all around the world. It takes you all around the world about what, where the ingredients come from, how they're yeah. originally made that go into the pie filling. Oh, then the, cool. the yeah, then the other one, it's all about the aluminum pan that the pie is made in, and mm. it's in the United States, you know, where oh. all the stuff comes from. So really neat stuff and just yeah. crazy. But the stock market game, you pay, I forget, it's, it's not that much a kid, and they give you a fake, I had to keep saying that word, fake, $100,000, and the kids invest it like they would a real stock market. Oh, wow. They have a program that they go in and it shows you the current stock market. That's what you use. I mean, real live stuff. And yes, if you buy it after like 4.30, it's it's after closing time because, you know, we're in a different time zone than New York. And so it goes on the next day and it's just like you're trading live. And so you can do either a semester or a year long competition and whoever makes the most money off of their hundred thousand wins. Do they win and, like, the amount that they actually like, <laughs> um, were able now, to invest? Now that would be nice, you know. But no, no. But yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, and we tried to do it, and you know, it's like some of the kids were, "Oh, we had to," and I'm like, "Oh, just come on, just try it." But just an experience that is just something that's different. Now, I do know a lot of our high school economic classes do this as mm-hmm. part of their program. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I didn't know ours did it until after I was already involved with it. And yeah. she's like, yeah, I've came to Boonville before and talked <laughs> to the high school kids. And I'm like, oh, really? Yeah. You're like, okay, but cool. <laughs> just a great resource if there's anything about yeah. entrepreneurship or the stock market or economics. And it goes, and she has stuff that goes down to an elementary level. Cool. I told you I would get way off STEM. I'm sorry. But no, the, the, the M in STEM though, because like that's a really good real world project. And I know it that is. there are some PT teachers and classroom teachers who listen, but also a lot of teachers who might want more like a math focused lesson because oh, I know yes. I talk more about like science being your base, but you definitely yeah. could use like entrepreneurship being like your base and that would connect yes. a lot with math. Oh, you can pull in so much. And what it does is, and that's why I tell people you can go to Economics Arkansas because Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is in your state, but it connects you to the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Okay. Um, And so you can get, they have lessons. And Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's like the, oh, who was it? I forgot. Anyway, but there's several different companies like that that are part of it that you can connect with. And it's just amazing the resources. Yeah, I had tried to get my kids, <clears throat> sorry, last year, one of the high school challenges is a $10 challenge. Okay. The kids take $10 of their own money and start a business. Oh, okay. So That's, yeah, it's not yeah. much money. Yeah. So I had talked to the kids about us doing that. I said, I would go to my church, you know, and yeah. just on Facebook and try to get sponsorships for them. That way they wouldn't even have to come up with the money and their parents wouldn't have to because cool. we are a really low socioeconomic school. Yeah. We're 100% free breakfast and lunch. Oh, wow. And I said, yeah, so I would get sponsors. And I guess they thought I was joking because we, we never really did it. But I had one girl last year that she already had a business going. She had started it in the summer. Aww. But I let her do her jewelry business all day, every day. And that's what she did cool. all during my class. That's awesome. And I, I never did think to ask her how much she made, but um, she sold jewelry. I mean, she, I mean, all, all kinds of stuff. Like I, I bought her some leather off of Amazon because you know how the leather earrings were yep. in style, you know, and 
she would have kids that would help her sometime design and some yeah. of them did advertisement for her and yeah it was really i mean we just kind of do a lot of you, anything you know, yeah. anything the kids can do yeah. you know you do a lot of like you do a really good job of uh, because like this is what we're going to get into anyway but you do a really good job of bringing like real world experiences to your kids that are authentic yes. and I know that you're really passionate about it you've told me that before but like I can <laughs> tell in your voice that you're passionate about it like oh, even for you. yourself like yes. for you as a learner you like the world real world experiences I do. and then you know how impactful that is for you as a teacher. And then you're bringing that to your classroom, which I know you're telling me about this whole Antarctica thing with some experts. Yes. So tell it more about that because you're like, re this is a really cool thing that you're doing with your kids. Okay. So we were at a chess tournament and it was like in November, I think. And my GT teacher sent me this email and I opened it up and it was like a long-term research, you know, and I was like, what in the world is this? And she said, well, she said, I know, she said, we're, you know, a lot alike. We like doing unique things and you like, you know, doing strange things. She said, so I thought you might be the person that would do this. And I was oh, like, yeah. okay. She's like, just go look it up and just get some more information. It's like, okay. So I looked at it and I was like, hmm, I get to work with a live researcher in Antarctica. Now, first of all, I'm from Arkansas, if I forgot to say that. I'm from Boonville, Arkansas. <laughs> Little bitty school. We're a 3A school. And we are in the middle of nowhere. Some of our kids don't even get out of the state, much oh, less wow. to go see the ocean. Yeah. Oh, and true, like, right? You're yes. Landlocked, okay. Right? Yes, we are landlocked. Well, like, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say, but my kids who are in the sixth grade and eighth grade, they just went to the beach the first time this oh. past summer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and if we hadn't had relatives that lived in Florida that we could stay with, I probably still would not have ever had the beach experience. Yeah. But anyway, so this was a, um, a research opportunity through Rutgers University. And it was the scientists are stationed at Palmer Research Station in the Western Peninsula of Antarctica. First of all, I had no idea how many research stations are in Antarctica. But if you've never looked that up, you need to look at a map. Oh. I wish I had the numbers in front of me. But it's like almost all the way around Antarctica. They're like different countries have research stations. I'm like, oh my either. God. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting map just to look at. So anyway... So I was like, hey, the worst they can do is not accept me, you know, no matter what. So I filled out the application and I sent it to my GT specialist. And I was like, hey, Karen, read this and tell me what you think. She's like, OK. And of course, they ask you, you know, why you want to do this? And I'm like, our kids are landlocked and yeah. some of them don't ever get to even see the ocean. And I try to bring in as many real world things as I can, because how many times as educators do we hear, why do we have to learn this? Yes. I mean, I don't think there's a teacher alive that has not heard that question. But if I, and that's why I'm so big on real world. If I can relate what I'm teaching to something in the real world, that explains that question. And I don't have to hear that. Mm-hmm. I don't hear it very often in this position. <laughs> oh, that's, that's really good, though, because you're it doing is, a good job. It is. Now, were all my kids interested in this? No, but I made them do it because they might not ever get to experience Antarctica again. Mm -hmm. So what it was is these researchers, of course, they rotate through Palmer Station and they spend different amounts of time down there. But they go down there. The program that we got accepted into was ID Antarctica. Hmm. So what it was is they were working on the whole thing centers around climate change. But what we don't realize is what all climate change affects, hmm. you know, and especially the kids don't realize it. Okay. Hmm. So for example, the basic or start of the food chain in Antarctica is krill. Okay. Yep. And of course, my kids are like, "What's krill?" Yeah. You know. <laughs> like, I don't know what that not, is. We're not there in our ocean. We don't and I'm like, in our Sorry, guys. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like how, how many y'all know what shrimp are? And yeah. they're like, "Yeah, we know okay. what shrimp are." I said, "Well, it's it's kind of like shrimp, yeah. just 
just think of it as shrimp. Mm -hmm. And I said, but that's the basic food chain. So if the global warming warms up the water, which it's doing in Antarctica, then the krill, it affects them because they like a certain temperature. Mm -hmm. So if the level of, or, or the depth of the ocean that they like for lightness, darkness, and, and all that technical mm -hmm. stuff. But if it's not the temperature they want, then they're probably going to decrease in population. So that means the seals that depend on them, mm -hmm. and then the penguins that depend on them, and then the whales, everything's going to have trouble. Yeah. Um, like another example of climate change is that the Adele penguins are the m most well-known penguins in, an, uh, in, in Antarctica. That is so hard to say. I know in, Antarctica. Hard to say. <laughs> yeah. in Antarctica. Um, okay. So the Adele penguins are cold weather penguins. They love ice. Mm -hmm. So with the climate change that's been going on the, the past years is that the ice is not getting as thick and there's not as much. There are research scientists that have been going down to Palmer Station since it first opened up. I think it's been roughly about 30 years. And they're like, we can tell you where the ice was mm -hmm. and how much has melted back onto land now. Oh, wow. And like their big icebergs, how much smaller they are. Huh. So I thought like it was all frozen down there, like the ocean and everything like was like frozen year round. Well, it's not. So I've, I've learned a lot, yeah. but they have what they call new ice. It's what's frozen in the past year. So it's, it's like your, you know, your, your fresh new frozen, you know, water ice in the ocean. So the big vessels they use, they're an icebreaker. So it does not have to slow down to bust through that one-year-old ice. Whoa. It, it, yeah, if it's less than a year old, it can just go right through it at the steady speed. It has to slow down when it starts getting in thicker ice. Mm -hmm. So they take this big icebreaker and they have this huge net on the back that they can drop. And they can set it to where at different depths, they can open up different nets. And so they can catch whatever is in the water at, at different depths. And so then they bring those and they take all that to the research station. And so it's, it's just, it's amazing what they, you know, what they do, but it all bases around climate change and how it's affecting everything. Mm -hmm. So because the Adele penguins, cause they are cold weather penguins, they are actually dying out. Yeah. And they're predicting, like, within so many years, there's not going to be any more Adele penguins. Oh, no. Yeah. So sad. Yeah, yeah that's how serious. Uh, it's hard for us around here, I know, to really think that climate change is real because it's hard for us to see any effects. But when you Google a map, and I did this at Palmer Station when we started working with them, of an aerial view, you know, 30 years ago of where the ice was, you know, the glaciers to what it looks like now, I was like, oh my goodness, you know, it's a big deal. And so there's other types of penguins that are coming in now that are warmer weather penguins that don't have to have the ice. Yeah. And just like the humpback whales, they are migrating down to Antarctica now. They used to never migrate down to Antarctica because it was too cold. So oh. they are actually, that was one of the other programs that I could have got chosen for was to track whale migrations. Mm, that's cool. And yeah, and the research scientists will tell you, you know, we used to never see the humpback whales because it was too cold for them. Yeah, and that's So not. everything is changing. You know, there's, you know, there's, you know, birds that come down that never used to, and it's just, it's a big difference. Okay. I was shocked when I saw a video of these guys working in Antarctica yeah. and they had on t-shirts and no jacket. I'm like, what? It's supposed to be cold down there. They said, yeah, this is their summertime. So they're the exact opposite of us okay. to where the Arctic, which is the North, yeah. they are on the same season as the U.S. Oh, and okay. Antarctica is just the opposite. Okay. Because So the yeah. Equator. Yeah. And that was one of the questions on our pretest that we had to take with them. <laughs> so see, I, I, I learned that I'm, and I'm retaining it. Yeah. But it was just amazing. But like I, 
the, the teachers that got accepted, and the reason it was so amazing is they only accepted three public school teachers for each of the three programs. So there was nine of us. <laughs> now, because they are from Rutgers, which is based in New Jersey, they do a lot of work in New Jersey, which is, you know, su- such a small state. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it doesn't take you 30 minutes to drive all the way across it. But they work with a lot of 4-H clubs up there. Okay. And they do this program with them. So there was probably that many 4-H clubs that were also in with us. Mm -hmm. So what we were going to get to do is they were going to, after they had been there a while, they they went down right before Christmas. They actually got to celebrate Christmas down there in Antarctica this year and and the new year. So that was kind of neat. But they had thought that they would start getting lessons to us the middle of January. And they asked us to do five lessons. And what it was, it was going to be using a dichotomous key using for identification of the animals. So what they were going to do, they had some like last year's that we could go practice on. And they have a picture. What we were sent, it was a bird. And then it had a krill in its mouth. And they asked us to use... um, basically the bird dichotomous key to identify the bird and then the zooplankton one to identify the zooplankton in its mouth. Yeah. So that was the first. Yes. And it's stuff (laughs) and it's pictures that they have taken this year. Oh, wow. Yes. That was what was so neat is that, um, yeah, it was like, just how often do you talk to them? Like, how often do you guys meet? Is it live or is it pre-recorded? Well, that's the okay. That that that's the big deal. The big hoopla on this was that we were supposed to get to have a thirty-minute Zoom meeting with our scientists. Yeah. Um, and our kids could send in twenty questions. So the three schools that were going to partner and be there that same day, we all got to send in twenty questions, and they were going to pick you know 10 to 15 questions per school then they were gonna send that list back to us so we would know yeah so we were all or I was really excited I thought this is so cool you know (laughs) but anyway it turns out that my live zoom meeting was the same day same time that I was receiving my award from the state department my GT program oh so what happened well I didn't want my kids to miss out so I asked one of our interventionists if she, which her son is in fifth grade, so he got to go through the program. So she was like really excited because she's like, Braxton's all the time talking about krill and Antarctica. And she's like, I don't know what he's talking about. So I asked her, I said, if I have everything set up and I will forward you all the emails, I said, would you please go down there to my room where I said, Are we, you can do it in your room. Mm-hmm. I said, and do the Zoom. I said, it's just going to be a 30 minute Zoom. I said, but that way my kids still get to participate. So. Because what I had originally planned is I was going to go down to our Gift and Talented conference on Wednesday, do that, come home Wednesday night, come to school Thursday morning, do my Zoom, and then drive back to Little Rock and finish out our conference for Thursday afternoon and Friday. No problem. No big deal. Then I get an email from the State Department that I was an Act 56 award winner. So I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) and I'm like okay there is no way I am not going to accept my award you know because this this was a big deal for me Mm -hmm. my act 56 award I I even have it right here I have it I'll show you I know I know everybody on the podcast can't see but I know when I edit the video eventually they'll be able to see oh well here I will hold it still then maybe woohoo that's so awesome so anyway so the Act 56 award is for the Outstanding Gifted Program. Yay! So what it is, is our Gifted and Talented Program, you have, the State Department has these minimum requirements that you have to do. Yeah. And there's like 10 categories, community involvement, curriculum, PD, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, the Act 56 is what you do above and beyond the minimum requirement. Okay. And... This is just my third year being the GT teacher. Ah, 
Wow. Look so, at you. Well, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Like you're like, look at all this stuff you're doing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> <The> snapshot. <laughs> I try. Um, but my GT specialist really encouraged me a lot. Or, uh, actually, she encouraged everybody to, not just me, but everybody. Because this was, she had somebody from her co-op had won it for three years in a row. And she's one like, keep the momentum going. And so it was an intense application to fill out because yeah. because our Gift and Talented Advocacy Council um, is the ones that read the application and select it. And the oh, names cool. are eliminated, so they have no idea. But they have these questions, but you have to tell what the minimum requirement is. But then you have to tell what you're doing above and beyond. But the problem is there is a character limit. <laughs> Oh, they, they like, tell you all this stuff. <laughs> I can't. I can't make it short and sweet. Um, so they want a narrative. They tell you, don't bullet. I mean, they want you to talk. You know, and and that's hard. It, it's hard for me. As much stuff as I do, I hate bragging about myself. And oh. so that was what I dreaded about this podcast the most is I don't know how to brag on myself. Oh, I mean, and, I think you do a great job explaining. Like, I could tell you do a lot. You just well, film this podcast. Like, look at my video, guys. <laughs> There you go. If you need other evidence, you can just okay. Do it yes, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. You are awesome. <laughs> so anyway, so I filled this out, and it was, I mean, several pages long. So anyway, they um, said you've won, and the amazing thing is, is it comes with a three thousand dollar cash award. Oh my gosh. So it, it went to my school district. So yeah. my district coordinator, she um, texts me and she's like, um, did you know you got this award and it comes with a $3,000 monetary award? And I'm like, yes, I did. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I went down and, 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 and accepted it at our GT conference. <laughs> and she goes, wow. And I'm like, now I, I I do get the money right. It doesn't go into general fund. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she goes. She goes. Well, I've got to contact the state department. She said whatever they say. And of course, they said it was designated for GT. So that's why I was so thankful for you when we did the three five work STEM workshop, and I was asking about the green screen and the stop motion and all yeah. that because. It's always nice when you know that somebody has firsthand knowledge of the materials mm -hmm. and whether it works or not. So that's why I asked for your list um, yeah. because, yes, this is a lot of money, but I don't want to just blow it totally. and then go, why did I spend it on that? Yes. And even though it's for the GT program, I would like for as many kids at our school to benefit from it as possible. And one of the things, and I think I told you about this at our 3-5 workshop, is that when I first took over this, my principal had even mentioned about us taking over morning announcements because oh, yeah. our principal does it every morning, you know, good morning, mm -hmm. Boomville Elementary yes, School, you know, school. Yep. and the lunch. And yep. I was kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. So when you were talking about the green screen and the stop motion and your video and production, I was like, oh my gosh, this would fit right in. And you could totally so, do it. I believe it. Yes. You. <laughs> so my, my GT, no, not me, the GT students. <laughs> yeah. See, teach the kids to do it. Oh, totally. Yes. So they could get to where they could eventually do it. But then the whole school would actually benefit, you yep. know, and then we might even be able to use that as a reward, excuse me, for like the top AR reader or something could come in and do the morning announcements with us, you know, and my kids could teach them how to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, just, you know, I, we're all yeah. the time looking for awards, you yep. know, that are incentives that are internal that we, we don't have to buy. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, that would be a really good one. It'd be and really like, good. Yes, we are celebrating Dr. Seuss week this week instead of last week. So, and I was thinking, you know, we, we could have kids come on and read a Dr. Seuss book or, you know, anyway. Just There's so many so, opportunities and like yes. it's real world, like we're talking about, like yes. my kids love it. This I've done it. This is my second year. And the kids are funny because they're funny with me because they like know I have a YouTube channel. So they oh. like, they listen to me because they're like, oh, she knows what you're talking. I'm like, I'm not that cool, guys. But I'm okay. Thank you. But anyway, yes. I've been doing it and they love it. It's just super like, 
it, it, they are passionate about this stuff because they love yes. like, this is totally them like presenting on camera <laughs> and like peer to peer. So it, like once you start doing it, you really see like a whole, like you said, you want all the kids involved, like the little yeah. kids look up to the big kids who are on camera. Um, the yes. big kids have this t-shirt. So like, oh my gosh, I can't wait till I'm on the news. Like the little kids yes. are so excited. <laughs> and then you can, like you said, have like them reading books and having them be more involved. Like you, um, we do like a joke of the day. So any kid can submit a joke. So it's just a really cool, like in-house, um, experience that, can grow with time, but I know you like, I think you'd be great at facilitating that because you're like all about the real world stuff. This is totally up your alley. <laughs> well, and it's so funny because we have so many kids that are bashful that don't want to get up in front of the kids and speak, but I think something like this, yeah. they would be just fine with it because, it, yeah, they will. you know, nobody would get to see them and you could cover up their little screen here yeah. on their computer and they'd never see themselves. Yeah. Or they could edit. They could be on the editing team. I yes. had to switch. Like I had some kids yeah. who were on editing and you're like, I think I really want to be on camera. But I also had some kids oh. who were like, I don't actually like being on camera. I really want to be on editing. So I've had some wow. kids pop, which is really, because they're both important. We actually, editing team yes. probably does a little more than the film crew. <laughs> yeah. See, that's crazy. And I hadn't even thought about the editing part yet. Oh, mm -hmm. my goodness. This <laughs> might be more in depth than what I'm, uh, oh, my. Well, see, and that leads me to. To something else and it and and I will chase a rabbit so you may just have to rein me back in <laughs> we might even but, do that just a two-part podcast because all of yeah we may so have fun. to we all didn't so even good. get through um <laughs> one of the other programs that I wanted to apply for um it's called Nauticus Live Ooh. and you actually get to go out on the ship cool <laughs> out, out around Hawaii <laughs> oh, but the problem is God. it's like Two to six weeks. Okay. So be because my kids are in sixth grade and eighth grade, I thought, eh, that, you know, two weeks, you know, yeah. daddy could probably take off a week and then I could probably, you know, beg some friends, you know, but I, I still, I feel really guilty. <laughs> but any more than that, I, I, I'm just, I couldn't ask my friends and family to pitch in and take care <laughs> of my kids for that long. And I know they probably would, but you get to work right alongside the crew, no matter what they're doing. If they are doing mapping the seafloor and they have their robot down there, you get to be right up in the control center, you know, watching them and, and just right beside them. So, and you get to rotate all around the ship. But one of the things that I loved is that they also schedule um, and this is something you could do with your kids. Yeah. You can get on the website and you can set up a time to where you Zoom with them. Cool. But what is so neat is one of the teachers that is actually on the crew gets to work on the podcast oh, with another neat. crew member. So, cool. yeah, so you are doing the podcast also while you're down there. And That's I thought cool. that would be so neat to talk into a class yeah, somewhere in the United States. That. I would still I, do that. I was like, oh, that would be awesome. Do you get so, paid to do it? Um, I think there is a little stop and I don't think it's much. But the deal is, is that they pay all your expenses to get there. Oh. And they will pay for your substitute the whole time. Oh my gosh. This yes. so, I, I hope you do it one day. But aren't you doing <laughs> something else this summer? Aren't you doing yes. another? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Because you're Hang doing on. something like all real world. Yes. <laughs> okay. Here is, yes, it's the, um, it's N-A-U-T-I-L-U-S live.org. And that okay. will take you to it. Okay. I'm um, writing this down. All of this is okay. going to be linked. I'm really yes. taking notes when you talk. So I know. Bless your heart. Okay. So this summer, ooh, I'm yeah. excited. And I, I will let you know how this turns out. Yeah, I'm so excited. So this is the third year, and it's called Steam in the Park. Cool. And they they are on Facebook. You can Google them. It, their website is really easy to navigate. Now, where did you tell me you're from? What state? I'm in Colorado. Okay. Yeah. That, that's what I thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what these people do, they are wonderful. This is their third year. 
So they, it's just a man and a wife who started it. And she is very passionate about education. And that's how they got started. But what they do is they have hooked up with the national parks and offer a week-long summer PD. Cool. And the wonderful thing is the first year they had like 30-something teachers. And I'm sure they were, you know, probably like local teachers or people they knew, you know, that they'd met. Last year they had, I think, like 170, 190. Whoa. And this year we have almost 400 teachers attending. <clears throat> wow, that's amazing. So my thinking was, I wish, I'm, again, I'm always looking for out-of-the-box PD yep. that's hands-on, you know, that that's different. And I was just going through Facebook and this came up. And I was like, okay, if they have have like more than doubled each year. And they're working with the national parks. Surely this has got to be a legit deal. You know, you're always yeah, worried about yeah. getting ripped off, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, these people are like super excited and it's great. So I called my GT specialist. Yeah. She She's a marathoner. She runs 10 miles a day. <laughs> and she's an outdoorsy person too. So I called her and I was like, hey, Karen. She's like, what? I was like, well, I found something on Facebook <laughs> and I really want to do it. And you were the first one I thought of. She's like, well, what is it? I was like, well, it's a week long PD. And I said, it's at a national park. So I, I mean, I was talking to her about it and she like pulled it up on her computer at work. And there's 12 national parks that are open this year for it. Of yeah. course, you know, they're all full right now. So we had decided to go to Cumberland Island, which was going to, you can choose your top three choices. We were, our first one was Cumberland Island and it's in Georgia, but it's right there at Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. So it was really neat because I think you got to like, hopefully the baby sea turtles were hatching at this time. Oh, I don't, I don't know. But so anyway, just, just the picture of the baby sea turtles is yes. what got me because I've always wanted to be there when they hatch. You know? I do too. I've seen them be laid live in front oh, of my face oh, in Mexico. No. Yeah, I saw I'm like the mommy, Yeah, it was oh. so crazy. And I wasn't drinking a lot. I was completely. <laughs> I, I, I saw three come out of the ocean and like they came out. I know. I They came out. And then they dug, they found a spot, they dug their holes, they laid their eggs, and she buried oh, it, buried yes. it, and then went to the ocean. We saw <gasps> three came out, and then one didn't like the spot. So we saw two lay the eggs, which was so crazy. I'm but so I've never jealous. seen the babies hatch. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, anyway, just the picture of the little baby sea turtles. Uh, like I say, I don't know if they're hatching now or the summer or when. But then our second choice is going to be Big Cypress down in the bottom of Florida. Cool. And then our third choice was the Smoky Mountains. Now, the reason we chose those three was because each park, again, me, real world, is one of the things you do is you actually work on a challenge that is facing that particular national park. Mm, that's cool. So, yeah. yeah. So, with the Great Smoky Mountains, one of their biggest claims, and I did not know this, is that they are the highest populated or highest visited park in the U.S. I did not know that. I didn't either. The other thing is that they have the largest salamander population in the U.S. What? As far as varieties, and, and, and I'm assuming number two. So you get to work with the salamanders. Now, of course, you're not supposed to disturb their habitat. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see all this. Yeah. And, of course, I'm one of these that I don't mind to get dirty or grubby, you know. But it, it was just, and I've, Karen and I, neither one have been to Gatlinburg. And so we're very excited because, of course, where we live, we're, you know, in the mountains. We love the mountains and so in the outdoors. And it's, it's just going to be exciting. We are going to actually leave on a Sunday morning. Ooh, I'll yeah. have to get somebody else to, to do my live stream at church. Need to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I do live streaming, but I don't say anything. So that's so different from this. Yeah, I'll have to get somebody to do that. That's, yeah. Okay. That's something else to write down on my to-do list. Get somebody to do the live streaming at church or the pastor may get mad at you. Um, but we are going to drive. Um, it, it's, it'll be like a 12-hour drive, but, you know, between the both of us, we'll drive straight through. And then um, we don't have to check in um, with the 
program until like three o'clock in the afternoon. So that will give us Monday morning to kind of look around Gatlinburg and do a few things. Well, we thought we were going to have the evenings free. You know, most stuff closes like at five. Oh, no, they have us out stargazing at night, laying on blankets. Oh, that's actually really cool. Yes, it is. And that's why it got us more pumped because we were like, okay, you know, we'll be able to go do stuff. You know, they said no. They said you you will not leave in your vehicle to go on a personal outing because we have too much going on. Wow. Yeah. Well, we're excited. So uh, another one of the things they do, which uh, I'm sorry, Stacy, I'm sorry, Daisha, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry for saying this, but we have to do nature journaling. Oh. If we could just write, I would be okay. Yeah. But they want us to draw. Oh, no. And- <laughs> <laughs> this whole episode has like come full circle. You're like, I can't. It talk. has. I, I yeah. got started in kindergarten. Now you're like, and now here I am journaling, and they're going to well, make me I'm gonna bring like stickers. Well, okay, get we this. Like stickers. Okay, hey, you are on the right track. I'm going to show you this. So this is a how book that. Teach, oh, how to teach nature journaling is the book. We are going to get this book there. That's good. It's like a twenty-five dollar book, but then a lady, a lady told me, "What's well, it's thick? This is double sided." And it's like, she said, "If you go to his website, you can download it for free." Perfect. So, don't tell my admin. You I pre- do this <laughs> as a lesson with your students. You're like, take them outside. Yes. And you guys could do nature journaling, and then you could practice with them. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. It says thirty-one field activities, Perfect. and it shows you how to draw birds. Yes. I never thought drawing a bird, you would start out with a straight line. What? Hey. (laughs) Hey, go to this website. The author is John, Uh J-O-H-N, M-U-I-R, Laws, L-A-W-S. Okay. Go to his website, and you will have to look at this book. How to Teach Nature Journaling. Yes. But, yes, I... Um, when I found out they want you to start drawing a bird with a straight line, I was like, okay, I, I got to close the book. <laughs> like, okay, and that's it for me. That's all my lessons yes. today. <laughs> yeah. But they say that this is really neat and that we can use it with our kids. Yeah. And, the, and the teacher did say that there was free stickers. Perfect. Now, I ran out of time, but that is what got me when she said there was free nature stickers that we could print. I was yes. like, that's what I need. Like, I need that. You're like, that's what I see. Oh, oh, I see a um, uh, lizard. You're like, sure, that's a lizard sticker right there. Yeah. You're like, you didn't even see it, but you just put it there. <laughs> I'm like, I want to have to go like to our Dollar Tree and stuff and find all the flowers. Perfect. And I'll, I will take markers and I'll yes. just go over the flowers. Yeah. Or get like tracing paper and like trace stuff. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, I have, I do have tracing paper. Yeah. I Maybe have tracing you paper. trace like a flower. I'm going to put that in that pile right you. there. <laughs> well, if there's like a teacher, because I know you're passionate, because obviously like your life experience like came like I really, because I feel like that does happen a lot with us as teachers. Yes. Like you've already loved nature. You, you like have so yes. much experience. Like you're curious about the world. If there's a teacher who's like scared to get started or like whether it's like getting experiences for their students or like doing something for themselves as professional development, do you have any tips for them? Like what would you recommend? Like, because you agree, I'm writing down all these lists, but if someone who's like not at the same level as you are, <laughs> where, where could they start? Okay, definitely. The first thing is you have to be comfortable stepping, not comfortable, but you have to be willing. W- willing's a better word. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And like, I guess for me growing up on the farm, I got dirty. I walked walked in cow manure, you know, walked in mud, you know. Anyway, so that's why it doesn't bother me getting dirty. But like one place that you can start is like we have a science museum in Little Rock. It's called Museum of Discovery. And they offer professional development workshops in the summer. And Oh my gosh, they are wonderful and they are STEM based. Yeah. Most teachers don't know about them. That's cool. I have gotten to know the ladies down there and it is just, it's amazing. But, okay, uh, they came up to our co op this year. Yes, I know, I'm, I'm getting off topic. But one of the activities she did with us for STEM, it was called needle felting. Ooh. 
cool. Now, I am not a knitter. I'm not a crocheter. I can't do cross art. I can't do anything like that. All this was is you get like a foam cushion. Yeah. Like a square of it, like an eight by eight. And you get your piece of material, you put it on top of there. And there are like these needles that are like really skinny. I, yeah. I could go get them if you want me to. And you put this wool, colored wool, just on there. And like, you're, you're going to take like a permanent marker before and trace your design. Like she told us to do something. Of course, I'm not the artsy crafty person, <laughs> remember? So I, I drew a bubble L. Oh, I was like, go Georgia, you yeah. know, you drew an L in a bubble letter, Cute. but all you do is you take your needle and you just poke. Cool. And that's all, all you do. Huh. My kids went crazy about it. Yeah. And they were like, this is all you do is just sit and poke. <laughs> Again, it's something that for some people, it's very relaxing. And some people th thought it was so slow. It was boring. <laughs> But, like, I bought a book that she recommended about how to make your straight lines, how to make yeah. it 3D. There are people out there that make, like, stuffed animals out of yeah, wool. Cool. And they look real. Weird. I mean, yes. It, it, it's, it's just crazy. But that's what I would suggest is just start with a hands-on workshop. Mm -hmm. Because, and no offense to people that have the workshops where they read the PowerPoints, but if you don't get in there yourself, and that's what I have found out, if you don't get in there yourself and do it yourself, it's hard to bring it back. Mm -hmm. But if you're at a workshop, like I, I could pull over in, in my teacher book right here and whip out our book that we made this summer. Yeah. Uh, and, but if you do it yourself and you have something to take back, whether it's a water tower or whatever. Um, another thing is your nature centers. Mm. Um, they will offer some PD, whether they do it or somebody offers it up there. Um, any of your, just any places like that, just contact them, yeah. you know, or, and a lot of them, they will come to your school and, you don't even have to do it yourself. If you're not comfortable with doing it yourself, call your nature center and ask them to come and present something to your students. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, your, Arcan oh, your Arkansas, your State Game and Fish Commission. Yeah, good idea. Okay. I found out that ours, even though the fish hatchery is on the other side of the state, when I was in sixth grade science, I contacted them. And we did a fish dissection. Cool. Now, <clears throat> I thought at first this was going to be like, you know, the paper one. And, you know, each we would just, you know, like the fold and, and stuff, you know, it'd just be papers. Nope. <laughs> they came wheeling in with an ice chest. So cool. <laughs> and the fish hatchery had caught the fish for them the day before and put them on an, in an ice chest on ice. Whoa, look at that. They were like six to eight inches long. Oh, wow. Yes. We opened them up on, and every two to three kids got a fish and which they had all the utensils. Yes, they were using scalpels and stuff. And we had to have a lesson on that. And, you know, yeah. it was pretty intense, but the kids loved it. Yo, I'm sure. now, I, had a, I had a couple that turned green and had to leave the room. But I mean, we got to do their insides and they went through what every organ was they got to see if it was a female she had eggs then we got to dig their eyeballs out and look at their eyeballs and then we cracked their skulls open and I don't know if you fish very much but probably about the size of your thumbnail yeah is about how big a fish's brain is when they're six oh. to eight inches long Oh. It's itty bitty tiny. Yeah. I mean, that's the smartest. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of, I'll put it like this. A lot of the kids, when they were trying to dig into their skull and crack it open, they smashed the brains oh. unknowingly because oh, no. they went too deep. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bitty tiny thing. But I mean, just even people like that, invite people into your classroom and they will do it for you. And mm -hmm. it will be free for three years. I had them come up, you know, different people did it e each year. But for three years, they came up and provided dead, but real fish for my kids to dissect. Yeah. And it didn't cost me a thing. Cool. And, and these people, it was probably a, I'm going to say a four hour drive for them. And they didn't mind a bit. 
and they and they stayed all day because then I had five classes and we started out first thing in the morning and they I thought well you know they'll do one or two classes and then that's it you know and I'll have to record it nope they stayed the whole day just excited all they asked was for a large trash can for it to be triple bagged and for me to provide paper towels perfect and yeah just but just anything that they can do to, like I say, if it's too much for them to get the hands-on, then invite people in that will do the hands-on with the kids. And I guarantee you that the kids will love the class, love the experience, and it will be huge. Oh, yeah. Just because the more you can get them up and doing stuff, the better they like it. Because, you know, that no matter how much they love technology, they get tired of sitting still, whether they have a screen in front of them or not, and they want to be up moving around. A hundred percent. Yep. That's absolutely right. That's what we need. Yeah. They miss out on that too. Like I feel like kids don't get experiences like this very often. Like we think they do, but it is a lot more device based and even think about what are they doing at home? It depends. Like it might not be dissecting a fish. Or, yeah, well, you know, yeah. I, I'm guilty, but I tell you what, after I had the Game and Fish come up and dissect, then the next summer when my own daughter, because she heard me talking about it, when she went fishing with her daddy, then she wanted to dissect the fish oh, cool. before he skinned it, you know, and he was like, why is Lily wanting to dissect the fish and asking me where the stomach is? And it's like, well, that's, because we dissect the fish. <laughs> that's my daughter. I was like. She came in and the science lab smelled like fish, you know, yeah. come on, dad. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's just, I, I try to do so much and just, and I, even with, even I go see kindergarten in first and second, once a week for 30 minutes, every class. And I just mm-hmm. rotate through them and the kids, that's what I, I love so much is when I open up that classroom door and they go, Miss Littleton's here. What are we going to do today? And I'm like, oh, as soon as y'all are all in your seats and quiet, then I'll tell you, you know. But, and I always have to apologize to the teachers. I'm like, I'm sorry, it's loud. If you need to leave, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but like this week, I took the little plastic gears. And so I told the kids, okay, I know we can turn these gears independently and yay, yay, big deal. But I said, I want to challenge you. Now, this was even my kindergartners. I said, I want to challenge you. So I did an example and I just put two gears together. And I said, see, when I turn one, then both of them turn. Mm -hmm. I said, I know we've built lots of stuff and we're big on building. But I said, we're not going to worry so much about building today. But I want you to try to connect these gears that when you turn one, every gear turns. And even these kindergartners that had never worked with gears before, it was amazing what they could do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some, yes, were just interested in building and that's okay. But the majority of them, I was just so flabbergasted that I was taking pictures of them. And I was like, this is amazing. Oh, yeah. Then when I got to first grade, they were like, oh, we have gears over there. And I was like, okay, what do I do now? And I was like, okay, well, here's the deal. You may have already played with these, but let me see if you've tried to do it right. Did you know? And then when I tell them about every, you know, turning one gear makes them all turn, they just looked at me like I was talking French. They were like, (laughs) what? They're like, no, you just build with them. And I'm like, no. No, there's some science. There's some engineering in that. So my example for both of them was the bicycle. Mm -hmm. I would say, how many of y'all have a bicycle? Raise your hand. Well, of course, just about everybody raised their hand. And I said, what do you think makes that chain turn that turns your wheels? And you could just see the little light bulbs coming on. And they're like, is that a gear? (laughs) And so, again, that real world application, they they saw the connect, even the kindergartners, you know, could start to understand. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested to see the ones that didn't, if they went home and looked at their bike to see that, yes, the chain was turning on, on the gears. Yeah, that's a good point. 
But the my aha moment, I have to brag on Miss Curly's class today. I got so excited. There was this one little boy, and yes, he was a teacher's kid, and he he's probably going to be in my class, but <laughs> in my GT class. But he he did a phenomenal job. One girl came over and goes, well, "That looks like a snake," Ooh. because he. He didn't just, you know, fill up the one tray. He had zigzagged it around. But every time he added one, he would turn another one and make sure they all turned. Interesting. And it was huge. Well, then his friend beside of him, his all turned. But he he just did the basic, you know, on, on the platform. They were two across, you know. So you turn, you know, not quite as creative, but he still met the criteria. He goes, what about if we connect ours? I was like, ooh, that collaboration, we're getting that in there, cool. you know. And so they figured out how to put theirs together, and they turned one, and it turned both of them. Yeah. So they got excited. So then they asked the little girl on the other side, because hers all worked. They said, do you want to join yours? And it all worked again. So, so then they cool. asked the girl on the other side of her. So there was four of them. Uh-huh. This was all their own doing. I I did not. I was not instructing them. I was strictly a facilitator. Yeah. I just took pictures. I didn't even say anything besides, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. But in the end, there was four of them that connected their projects because they all did exactly what I told them to that. To make sure that every one of your gears was turning when they turned one. And so I stopped the whole class and I made the whole class come over. And I'm like, look at what they made. Aww. And everybody's like, oh, because it covered like, hmm, I had I had to look real quick. Yeah. I think it covered like four desks. <laughs> I mean, a teacher's desk. I love desk. like to build giant things. But it's yes. Okay, things let's see. Too. I'm sorry, it was three deaths, but yes, it was That's amazing, good. but they were just so excited, but just that they decided to keep adding on themselves and doing that collaboration, you know, oh, yeah. the biggest fight was who was going to get a turn it, you know, totally. oh, of course. <laughs> yes, so my other thing I want to share is my other new experience this year, if that's all right. Yeah, so here it is. It's a picture of it. Yeah, helping students so, learn. What is it? Yes, helping students learn the place where they live. The project is called the Artifact Box Exchange Network. Oh. So if you want to Google, their website is the is artifactbox.com. Okay. Here. I'll, I know everybody does this when they try to show you stuff and then it's all blurry and they I can't know. see I it. Know. I wrote it down too. <laughs> for the okay. Time. So what this was is we've all had those pen pals. And we exchange postcards and yada, 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 you know, and that's fun. But I was wanting to do something more in depth with my third graders. I wanted to teach them more about Arkansas. Last year, they learned, you know, the state symbols, you know, and blah, blah, blah. That's the end of their year, you know, hoopla. And that's fun. They love it. I wanted to continue that on. One, to help them with quiz bowl, because I'm also the quiz bowl coach. Oh. So, yeah. Oh, well, I'll, I'll inform you more about that later. It's so funny. So I found this on Facebook. I was like, well, I'm, I'm good. just going to email them and ask. Yeah. So Brian Reed is, is the one that's took it over now. And he said, well, he said, you can buy the teacher's book. And what we do is we have some introductory deals. And then we have all these clues. Now, tell me if you, I mean, is that to where like you can focus and read oh, it? No, I can't. But nope. oh, there's okay. like they're little sections of clues. Yes. Okay. So like there's 25 clues. So one is like number five is a food product. Describe the foods that are produced in your area. Find a sample of a food product that is produced in this area. It can be a local cash crop or a manufactured food product like candy or prepared foods. Be careful to remove any writing that would give away the town or state location on the package. Is it wise to include a food sample that might rot or decay? What unique foods come from your area? What food is produced in your town? Cool. So, so you do everything from the weather, the, you know, NFL teams, but every school answers the same clues. Cool. So what you're trying to do is 
we, of course, the teachers knew we had to email each other and set it up. But our students were putting together a box with all the answers to these questions. We were going to ship it to a school. They were going to use our clues and try to figure out first what state we were in and then see if they could narrow it down to our region and hopefully our town. Oh, that's really cool because that's so, like a, I've heard of yeah. stuff like this, but this is way more in depth. Yes. So it was one a research project, which yeah. in the gifted world, in GT, that's a big standard is research. Okay. And what I love about GT and STEM is the creativity, both of them. That's important in both of them. Critical thinking, mm-hmm. that is so big in both of them. And collaboration. Yeah. You know, that All is. The four C's. Yes, the four C's yep. are big in GT and STEM. And that's why I love that they go together so good. So, this project, which I, I'm going to tell you, third grade was a little bit young. They kind of got tired of it. And yes, I had to finish it. But. <laughs> It was something that we had to mail it off. So we had another school expecting it. So, I mean, I had to. And I didn't want to burn them out. And this was my first year. I didn't really know what, you know, it was hard for me to explain it to them because I really didn't know. But the teacher we sent it to was so, she was so sweet. Ended up, our school was in Minnesota. And one of the students on the school of Minnesota did posters. Okay. And yes, it was, she said, this is the first time we, everybody got to do the posters. Well, one of the kids read on there that said, we are in the Midwest. Are they not, aren't they not supposed to do that? Well, see, I mean, we, I messed up and forgot to erase Boonville on some of them. So <laughs> <laughs> she, she told me, she said, we, she said, but I had mine sorted hard, medium, and easy. Uh, okay. So they would do the easy ones last, you know. But yeah. So, but anyway, so I said, well, okay. So here we go. We have the Midwest. Y'all need to Google and see what states are considered Midwest, you know. So, of course, different websites had different ones. So I said, that starts narrowing it down. So we had our map up on the whiteboard. And I said, so it narrows it down to these, you know, and that's what we've got to keep doing. And then, one student, which he's a football player and really into sports, he looked at the newspaper article of a football player and it had his first and last name and then their mascot, like he did something for the Chargers or something. And he goes, is that an NFL team? Oh. I said, I don't know. So he went to the Chromebook and typed in the kid's name and place for the Chargers. He goes, This isn't an NFL team. This is a high school team. Oh, he found it. Oh, he found, I mean, and when he clicked on the article, he goes, Miss Littleton, I think I found the school. (laughs) That's cool. What a cool project. Yeah. Yeah. So I really liked it. And this is what I did my proposal on for NAGC. Oh, okay. Perfect. If I get accepted, I hope I do. This is this will be the first time that I've ever presented at a national gifted and talented conference. Yeah. So I, I, I called the guy or actually I emailed him and I said, Hey Brian, I loved your product so much. I said, Is there any way that you would let me submit a proposal to present on it at NAGC? Cool. He goes, That's fine. Aww. He said, I would be so happy. Yeah, that's so and nice. I said, really? Because, you know, if you do somebody's project, you know, product, you're supposed to have their permission, you mm-hmm. know. And so I was like, I would not dare do it without your permission. Yeah. But he was like, yeah, that's fine. He said, just let me know. He said, yeah. I would love to know if you got accepted. He said, now, the funny thing is, he said, is that I'm a reader for a lot of places for proposals. He said, so if I see that one come across, he said, I'll be sure. And he said, excuse myself. Yeah. So I, I sent him the whole proposal, you know, what I had named it and everything. Aww. And I said, just wanted you to know. And I said, now, I said, for further reference, um, is there anything that you would change? You know, you've done proposals. You know, you have very limited n- numbers, like 60 words, and, th- and that's it. So it's hard. But he said, no, you did a really good job. So Aww, good. I was excited. And for you too. So I will find out in May yeah. if I was accepted or not. But know. So, you know, when I 
when I started uh, submitting proposals to NSTA when I was teaching sixth grade science, I did not get accepted the first time. Mm -hmm. I was let down and I wanted to quit. But I said, no, you just got to keep going. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, my my science specialist that I was talking about, Dr. Varnell, he was the one that encouraged me because I had presented a lot of local co ops uh, Mm -hmm. or workshops at our co op, some with him and some on my own. And he was like, You've got the personality. He said, You need to be presenting workshops. Totally. I agree. And and I said, (laughs) If I ever decide to stop teaching, you know, this is what I want to do is present workshops. You know, I don't know who or where, you know, but this is what I hope. I, I get to do in my third career. <laughs> I think you'll be able to do it. Yeah, you but can. You can do it now. <laughs> I, I just, I love it. And I think one thing is that when I was going to those NSTA conferences, it rejuvenated me because I learned so much. But I also got to network with other teachers and share. So that's one thing that I, I want to tell teachers too. If you haven't ever been even to a state conference, yeah. Or, I mean, if your school will let you go to a, 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 a national. Now, in science, I have went and presented at the STEM conference that NSTA does in the summer. Woohoo! Yeah. I loved it. And then I have presented at their fall conferences. Cool. Loved them. And then I've actually presented at one nat one of the big, big national conferences in the spring for NSTA. So they have the small, but they call call them regional ones in the fall. And then their actual big national one is in the spring. So I've hit all three of them, presented at all three of them, loved them. And I, I mean, you, you just, you meet so many people. Of course I can go up and talk to a total stranger and you know, everybody's wondering, how did you meet somebody from England? And I'm like, I just saw somebody start talking and said, hey, where are you from? But I mean, a lot of it is your attitude. And that's what I think. If you've got the positive attitude, you want to learn. And and that's another thing is that if you've got the right attitude, is that if you see yourself as a lifelong learner, you have the positive attitude, the enthusiastic attitude, it rubs off on your kids. You know, because mm-hmm. I, I, I told him today I was trying because this I read somewhere. This is careers week, you know, for science or the GT world. I, I can't remember. So I, t- I challenged my sixth graders to think about a career that they wanted to do and research it. And of course, my own daughter was like, Mom, she wants to be a pediatrician. <laughs> she said, you didn't tell me I was going to have after four years of undergrad and then this many years of med school, then I was going to have to do a three-year internship that's not paid. And I was like, yeah. (laughs) And she goes, I need to marry somebody rich while I'm young. (laughs) I said, honey, everybody makes it work. Somehow you you find a way to do it. I said, but do not, I said, not do something just because you're afraid of going to school. So I told him my example Mm -hmm. that when I was growing up, I wanted to be a vet because of the farm, because I I loved helping animals, you know, get well. I hate seeing sick ones. But the thought of going to school for four years of college and then three years to vet school, seven years of college, I said, I don't want to do it. I was burned out when I graduated college in three and a half years. I was tired, didn't want to go no more. And I said, okay. Now look at them diplomas up on the wall. I said, I went my four years. Then when I got my non-traditional license, that was two years with the State Department. So you might as well say two years of college because that's basically what it was. They crammed four years of college in us in two years on the weekends. So two years there. My first master's was two years. My second master's was a year and a half. That's a lot, right? And then you go back and add your four years of undergrad. Yeah. I have more college in me now than what it would have took to be a vet. Yeah. And, I, and I told him, I said, I'm not saying I, I made a mistake, Mm-mm. but I'm just saying, don't let that college, you know, and it's like anything. Don't let the fear of the unknown or that it's too much for you or that you can't do it, you know, just have confidence in yourself Mm -hmm. and just go for it. And just like, you know, the first time I I got denied my proposals, you know, I wanted to give up. And I was like, no, I got to keep trying. That's just the first time. Yeah. So just keep trying. And even if you go to a workshop, 
you're trying to bring stuff in and you go to a workshop and you are just overwhelmed because it's too much. You know, just take one thing back to school. And I think, you know, don't try to incorporate everything. You know, incorporate one thing. And then the next summer, go to another hands-on workshop and, and try to incorporate two things but still bring in that one thing from the previous year. And I think if you'll just try to do it slowly, because that's where I overwhelmed myself is I tried to incorporate everything. And of course it it, it didn't all work, but some did. But for those that aren't the, you know, gung ho enthusiastic person, you know, just, you know, take it slow, baby steps, you know, and that's what I'm having to do, you know, in this GT position, you know, I mean, Woo, I have changed and changed and changed and, you know, I'm still doing stuff different this year. But I mean, you know, that award right there is proof, you know, that you can do it, you know, and it makes it so weird. Oh, and I forgot to tell you my other award. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Here, this is supposed to be a STEM one and I forgot my STEM award. Oh my gosh. See, I have too much. I told you, I'm scatterbrained. In 2017. Yeah. I was voted the STEM teacher of the year by our local educational And so I have that plaque up on the wall. So So, yeah. So I got a teacher of the year for STEM and now I have program of the year for GT. So, I mean, it's amazing. And I I know your students, I'm sure love, love, love your class and like, (laughs) <laughs> they're like, look, like there's so many things you can do and I'm still learning and there's so many opportunities to learn and awards and um, places we can connect. Like learning is endless. Yes. So I know like they probably love that about you. <laughs> yes. And my husband ha- hasn't even heard this one yet. So today during school, my oldest daughter's phone number shows up on my phone and I'm like that must be really bad because she's not supposed to be on her phone during school and I'm like hello what's wrong and it it's it's her teacher she's like hi and I was like Miss Lee what are you doing calling me she goes well we have a question yeah I said okay and Miss Lee is the English no math teacher right math teacher I'm looking at my youngest like she should know never mind sorry and I was like, what are you up to, Miss Lee? She said, well, we have a question. I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Kaylee's like, I told him you would do it. She's like calling in the background. I'm like, do what? She's like, well, you can drive the minibus, right? And I said, (laughs) yes. She said, well, we have 12 kids in beta and junior beta. She said that have qualified for nationals. And I said, okay. She said, would you be willing to drive the minibus this summer to nationals so these kids could go and compete? And she goes, would you like to hear the list? <clears throat> so 90, probably 97% of them are my GT kids from over at the junior high. Okay, so you know them. I know them. And I was like, oh, okay, where's it at? She goes, Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> I was like, let me look that up. Well, it said it was a nine and a half hour drive. Oh, no. I would no, no. <clears throat> and I said, but when you take in kids and how long it's going to take them to even eat a lunch, because I would not let them eat it on the bus. We might pull over on a camp at a the side of the road and eat. But oh, my God. I said, we're looking at a 12 hour drive. <clears throat> no, thanks. And I said, Okay. You may have to commit me to the mental institution, but Uh, I said, if you can get approval from the school and they will pay for the hotels and the registration for these kids, I said, I will drive. Oh, yes, I'm nuts. You deserve an award for that. (laughs) And, And so I knew she had me on speakerphone, you know, and I said, here's the deal. I said, which I was kind of lying, but don't tell them that. I said, the only reason I'm thinking about doing this is because the majority of these kids are my GT kids. Yeah. And I would want, if my daughter was one that qualified to go to nationals, I would want the school to pay for her way so she could go. Because Aww. like I say, we are a small school district. I, I know not the smallest, but if we had 12 junior high kids qualify for nationals at the beta convention, I want them to be able to go. Totally. That is, that is something that they will never 
might not get to never experience again. I hope they do. Yeah. But I was like, okay, yeah, if you can get them. At, but I told her, I said, now, here's the deal. I said, I want to have a meeting with parents and the kids. Because if I'm going to go and be in charge, I said, they're going to know my rules. And Kaylee's like, uh, Miss Miss Georgia, they're really good kids. <laughs> I said, because she, she knows I'm going to be strict. They're going to stay with me. They're not going to be running all over Louisville by themselves. I said, they may not like that, but they will stay with me and I will be accountable for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yes, yeah, so <sighs> the Junior Beta Club sponsor is going to go ask the school oh, man. if... So, yes, if we can go. So, that might be an adventure. So, June, I'm going to need some prayers for June because the first week in June is when I'm going to Gatlinburg for a week for the steam in the park. Yeah. And then towards the end of the month, if this works out, I'll be taking 12 junior high kids to Louisville, Kentucky. You're going to be busy this summer. <laughs> I'm going to get my miles in. You're so busy. So, but yes, but I, I just thought, you know, these kids need to be able to experience that. That's what we want. We want them to see that reward. We want them, you know, to be able to say, hey, I got to go to nationals my seventh grade year in beta, yeah. you know, yeah. and not everybody can do that. No, and you're, you're the great first best person. Uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I appreciate your time so much. And I know teachers are going to love hearing all your experiences. Like I can see the passion, but you can hear it in your voice. Um, oh, and I wrote down you. everything that you said. So I will link <laughs> Bless everything. Your heart. <laughs> um, and I always take notes in interviews. Um, because I know people will want all the, all the links. You have a lot of cool all the um, links. Yes. All the cool things. Um, is there a way that teachers can connect with you if they have any questions and you want to chat? Yes. Um, my, I don't know if people usually do email addresses, yeah. but you are welcome to put my email address. It's just georgia.littleton at Um Then I'm on Facebook. It's Georgia Goldsmith Littleton. Um, not probably very many Georgia Littletons, but you'd be surprised <laughs> how many people have the same name. Yeah. Um, and then I have just recently, and so like very recently, so there's like n probably nothing on there, yeah. but I'm trying. So I did set up a Twitter account. Oh, perfect. And it's, yeah, Georgia GT STEM. Nice. Imagine that. <laughs> so I still have to get somebody to um, explain Twitter to me and how it works. Me too. But I'm, I know. <laughs> You know, but I don't do Instagram. I just I, I can't get into that one. But um, so baby yeah, step. I'm good. Okay. Baby step. See, I I I've created the Twitter account. So, but yes, but that they can find me. That they can email if anybody has any questions. They can email me, and I will be happy to share anything. I'll I'll visit with them. I'll call them. I'll zoom them. But. Anything I can do to help people, I, I just want to encourage everybody that defines your passion in teaching. Yeah. And, you know, we all, we, we can do such a better job teaching if we have a passion. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard. I was just asked that question, what is your passion? And I was like, oh, I don't know what my passion is. I just want to help kids. <laughs> I think like real world learning, I mean, I'm answering the question for you. Yeah. But you're really good at like making yeah. connections to why right. learning is fun and hands-on and it can apply to everybody. So I answered it for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's kind of what I ended up putting. Oh, okay, so good. yeah, but <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have lots of resources and I love doing, if anybody has any crazy out of the box stuff that I can do, like the Antarctica deal or the artifact exchange, I'm mean, just shoot them to me and I would love to do stuff. So, well, yeah. I appreciate, I'm sure they will. I'm sure you have people reach out and then buy, give me like an expert at Twitter after this. You'll have all the Yay! people chatting with you. But. <laughs> But thank you so much for your time. And I love all your stories. And I know all the teachers are going to love hearing them too. So I appreciate you so much for doing this. Thank you so much again.
Well, thank you for hosting the K2 and the 3 5 STEM workshop so we could meet. I appreciate yeah. it very much. Yes, of course. Yeah. They're so much fun. I'm glad you got to go home live. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was. I enjoyed it. See, you yes. never know what experience you're going to get something out of. So. Oh, absolutely. You're so right. You just have to try. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, well, thank you so much. I know I talked a lot longer than what you wanted. Oh, and no, I, you're I, good. I, <laughs> no, you're awesome. All right. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Elementary STEM Coach Podcast. I would love to connect with you over on Instagram at Naomi Meredith underscore or send me an email to elementary STEM Coach Podcast at gmail.com. Also, make sure to check out my website, Naomi Meredith.com, to see all the show notes from today's episode and shop my K 5 STEM resources. Any questions you have, needs for resources, or ideas for episodes, get in touch. I'll talk to you soon.